I tell you what, it's been a challenging year, but really every year is a challenge, right? This one just became more obvious about the challenges that were in front of us. And uh, I, I, I just really sensed in my own heart, I, you know, I was getting ready for Sunday and, and just what we're doing this year. And, and I want to give you a little bit of just kind of direction of where we're going to go. Um, you know, one of the things that have increased enormously is, is our, our online view. And so I welcome those of you that are joining us, uh, whether it be live or you're watching at a, at a later time. Um, but we have seen that there's nothing that can hold back the Word of God. You know, you can't damper the voice of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing that holds it back. And um, we've seen new ways to do things, new challenges, but I kept praying, Lord, where are we going? And, and I just want to give you a little bit of a, a, a direction that we're going because we need to be, um, we, we need to be growing in our walk with God. How many of you would say growth is good? Anyone, anyone think growth is important? How many of you have little babies would like to keep them that way forever? Well, when they get older, you say, I wish they could go back, right? But when you have the child, you're like, when are they going to grow up? And all, you know, it's always changing. I, I, I can tell you that the clothes I wore when I was five years old don't fit me now. Why? Because growth took place. And so there, there's always growth that's happening. And so it is supposed to be in our spirit as well in our walk with God, in our journey with Christ. Not to become religious, but to understand what it means to have a real relationship with God. How many of you know that God loves you right now exactly the way that you are? He loves you the way you are. I, I struggled a lot when I was kind of growing up because I thought I had to become something else in order to become acceptable or good enough for God to love me. And it wasn't until I realized that God loves me exactly how I am. But once, once I came to that realization, I realized he just didn't want me to stay there. He wanted me to grow. He wanted me to become better, just like our children, when, when you see them graduate, you want them to go on, whatever direction that is, and you want to see better for them. You want to see growth. You want to see health. You want to see, uh, you know, a relationship for them. You want to see grandbabies eventually. It, that's growth. And so it is in our walk with God that no matter what age you are or where you're at in life, God says, I love you right where you're at, but now I want there to be a growth. And we've got to cooperate with that. And what I want to do is, is I want to talk to you today about where will you stand? That's going to be the question on the floor. We're going to look at Luke chapter 22. If you want to turn there and get prepared, we're going to talk about the story about Peter when he's following Jesus. But while you're doing that, let me just uh, explain a little bit of where we're going to go in, in the next few weeks. We're going to be starting next week a series on spiritual growth, SG21 we'll call it. And we're going to talk about spiritual growth. What does that mean to us? wherever you're at in your walk with Christ, what does it mean to grow in your walk with Christ? What, we're going to start with the obvious thing, is, which is this. Why should I want to grow? Because no one's ever going to unless they see the benefits or the reason why we should grow in our walk with Christ. Then we're going to talk about some of the specifics. And, and uh, we're going to look at everything from conversion to faith to sin to prayer to giving to whatever it is. And look at those areas and challenge ourselves in our walk with Christ where we need to be growing. Because I believe that we have a room full of people and I believe that we have uh, through online a whole host of people that are saying, I want to grow. I want a closer walk with God. But have you ever felt like you wanted to have a closer walk with God, but the more you wanted it, it seemed like the less it was happening? Have you ever felt that way? Uh, you, you desire something in your walk with Christ, but it seems like something holds you back. And, and we want to talk about those things, and more importantly, what we can do about it. Because God has equipped us with every tool that's necessary to be able to grow in our walk with Christ. But I start today with just simply asking, where will we stand? As we start this year, and we go through, by the end of 2021, the question is, where will we stand? Where, where, where will we be? Uh, will we have made choices that have honored and glorified God? And I'm going to tell you right now, we're probably going to make some poor choices or some mistakes. We'll probably screw a few things up because I've done it in my, in my past. How about you? Yeah? But yet God loves us in the midst of our screw-ups, in the midst of our mistakes, because there's such a grace that's there. So today I want to talk to you about what, what I'm going to focus on is our closeness with God, if I can use that word. I felt it was very appropriate to be able to talk about our closeness with God because we've had a year where we've been told to stay away. 
We've been told to allow there to be distance. As a matter of fact, if you don't remain distant, you're ostracized. You're looked at as if you're the problem, which I get that we have to use wisdom in what we faced last year. I'm not saying that that was necessarily wrong. But I want to help us to understand that in our walk with Christ, where, where do we stand right now? And where do we want it to be? Because there's nothing that can hold, hold God back. Amen? Can we agree on that? There's no reason that we can say, in my walk with Christ, I'm limited because. There's just no answer, except for something that we've decided or chose. Or for some reason, we've decided not to draw in close to God. As a matter of fact, it's a very powerful verse. It's up on the screen. It's in your outlines. I want to read it together. James chapter 4, verse 8. You ready? Nice and loud. Ready? Go. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Familiar verse. But this is one where we have to not only just say, yeah, I know the verse. We have to learn what it means to embrace this verse, uh, this scripture that God gives us. Are we going to be better, uh, let's say at the end of 21, um, and say, this is where I stand because I've drawn near to God? Or are we going to continue to allow there to be space? So before we can get uh, this closer walk with God, we have to recognize the importance of closeness. How important it is that, that God is there with us. Because anything we want to accomplish, we really can't do in our own strength. Did you know that? Oh, we, we can get up and dress ourselves and do things like that. But you can only do that because God gave you the strength and the muscles and the wisdom to be able to do it. It all starts and ends with him. And he says, if you draw near to me, he says, I will draw near to you. He, he didn't say uh, there's conditions. He said, I will draw near to you. So it's an absolute truth that he will draw near to us when we draw close to him, which leaves us with the question on the floor, how are we doing with that? Where do we stand in our walk with Christ? Now, I want to say this up front. As we go through this message, there, Jesus never brings condemnation into our life. There is therefore now no condemnation. Do you remember the rest? To those who are in Christ Jesus. If you get a relationship with Christ, he says, I never bring condemnation. Conviction the Holy Spirit will bring. Have you ever felt convicted? You, did, you know, I shouldn't do it. You know, that's the Holy Spirit. You know, you, you shouldn't rob that store. You shouldn't steal that gum. You shouldn't, you know, talk about people behind their back. Whatever it is, the Holy Spirit will convict you. And he'll basically say, you know that's not right to do, right? And then we still get a choice. But condemnation is, it sounds more like this. Condemnation sounds like this. Uh, you did it again, you loser. I mean, what were you thinking? Are you dumb or what? That's what condemnation sounds like. And that's what the enemy consistently tries to put in our head and put in our heart. He'll condemn us in a heartbeat. The Holy Spirit just convicts. So when I ask the question, where will we stand and how are we in our walk with God? Remember that the Holy Spirit, when he brings conviction, it's always because he wants to give you something more, something better, something healthier. The enemy comes and he tries to steal that. Sounds like a Bible verse, doesn't it? John 10.10, 10. the enemy comes to steal, to kill, destroy. But God comes to give life and to give it to the fullest or more abundantly. So, it's very clear that God has a promise for us and that when we draw near to him, he has something he wants to reveal in our life. In Jeremiah chapter 29, it's in your outlines there, it says, you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. Underline that right there. And I will hear hear you. You will seek me, and then underline this, and find me. When you and I seek the Lord, he says, I will be found when you seek, with, uh, when you seek me with all of your heart. Uh, it goes on to say a little bit more, but I'm going to stop right there. You see, we just need to understand this. When you seek the Lord with all of your heart, he says, you are going to find me. Isn't it good to know that we serve a findable God? How many of you uh, appreciate the fact that when you needed grace, it was there. When, when you needed forgiveness, it was given. When you needed that acceptance, he embraced you. You see, he's a findable God. He says, if you, find, if you seek me, you will find me. You don't have to question that. When, when my kids were little, uh, they'd always want to play hide and seek. Uh, you know, they, they were little kids. I, I don't even know the ages, but teeny tiny, you know. And we had a lot going on. I, we were at my mom and dad's, and I think it was probably Christmas. So, you know, everyone's trying to figure out the food and the gifts, and the kids are running around, and a couple dogs are barking, and it's just kind of crazy. 
And then your kids come up and they say, Daddy, Daddy, let's play hide and seek. And I was like, I, not right now. Oh, no, we want to come play hide and seek. And I, I said this. I said, okay, go hide and I'll come find you. But that was the dad answer right there that said, go hide. And if I happen to remember later, I'll come find you. The problem was is I didn't remember. It was 30 minutes later and Lisa says, have you seen the kids? And it dawned on me, I forgot they're hiding. And I'm supposed to come find them. So I started, we started looking all around the house, and I ended up finding one, one of them was underneath a coffee table, fast asleep. Went to sleep, because they were, they were hiding, waiting for this father that was supposed to come find them, and never did. I found the other one in a closet, just hiding out in the closet, and dozing off in that. Now, you see, my kids said, I'm going to hide, come find, let's play this game, Dad. But their dad, their earthly dad, forgot. Their earthly dad didn't come through. But how many of you know that we serve a God that is a findable God, and no matter how lost you think you may be, you're never so lost that God can't find you. You're never so lost. Whether that means salvation, if you're here today and you've not made a decision for the Lord, you are findable. There's nothing you can do that's ever going to push God so far away that he says, I'm done with you. If you've heard that voice, that's the condemnation we were talking about. But the Holy Spirit would say, I'm here. You know, he's like Motel 6. He's always got the light on, all right? He's always there with open arms. He's always waiting for us. And though I may have forgotten to go and find my kids, uh, God's always there. He says, I am a findable God. He always lets us find him. What we need to do, you and me, we need to draw near to him. Because his word says, draw near to him, he draws near to you. The Bible says this too, in Psalm 65, verse 4. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near. Blessed is that person. To dwell in your courts, we shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house and the holiness of your temple. You see, it clearly states that being in close proximity to God is the most satisfying state that you can ever have in life. How many of you remember the song that was out there? Uh, Was it the Rolling Stones? I can't get, no. Mm -mm -mm. What is it? Satisfaction. You know, this world says, I can't get, no, which is grammatically horrible. (laughs) But it says, I can't get any satisfaction. And to some degree, they're very true. You cannot get the satisfaction you really want in this world if you're looking to the world to be the giver of that satisfaction. But what you can do is know that God gave you a promise that says, but I can completely satisfy every need that you have in your life. If you're here today and you're saying, I, I, I'm not satisfied in my financial status. I'm not satisfied in my home growing up. I'm not satisfied in my marriage. I'm not satisfied with the loss that I've experienced. If you go to the world to try to find a way to fill that void, you're not going to get the satisfaction you really want or need. That's necessary. So where do I get that? You get that from the presence of be- being in the presence of Jesus. You draw near to him, and he draws near to you. But pastor, you don't understand. I'm broken. I'm hurt. There's a lot of pain. But the Bible says that he's near those that are broken, nearer to those that are, are brokenhearted and going through difficult situations. You can never outrun God. His grace will always be there, no matter what you're doing. But the question remains at the end of the day, where will you stand? Where will you stand in your relationship with God? Is it three feet apart? Is it nine feet apart? If you listen to last year, it's supposed to be six feet, right? (laughs) But you see, God says, no, I want you to draw as close as you can to me. My challenge to you, church, and is going to be today, and as we go through this series, is going to be drawing near to the Lord in our own personal lives so that we can see breakthroughs where we've not seen them before. So that we can grow spiritually together in an understanding of how much God loves us. Do you know that um, this community, this world, if they're going to see any light or any hope, where do you think it's going to come from? Well, it's supposed to come from the church as believers. You and I, can I remind you that we are ambassadors for Christ, the Bible says. And you know what the job of an ambassador is? The job of an ambassador is to go into a foreign land, a foreign territory, and represent the United States of America. God has said that you and I are ambassadors for Christ. And he says, I'm placing you on earth, but you don't belong to the world. You belong to him. And he says, but while you're there, you will be ambassadors for him. And therefore, we must draw close to him. 
so that we can face all of the challenges that we face in life. I can't think of a better man in the Bible than Simon Peter who understood this. He had the challenges of, uh, have you ever had this thought? I did when I was younger. If I were a disciple, I would have it made, right? I mean, walking with Jesus, I mean, walking down the road and I'm hungry. Man, I really crave a Big Mac. Jesus, what do you say, you know? Whip me up a big man. You know, I'm thinking he could just snap his fingers and do whatever. If I was walking with Jesus like the disciples, I would never have a problem, right? I'd never have issues or worry or stress. But you know, along with me, that as we read our Bible, they had a lot of challenges. As a matter of fact, they probably had more. So some people look at growth and say, why would I want to grow in my walk with Christ, knowing that it just paints a bigger bullseye on my chest? But the reality is simply this. If you choose not to grow, you're still a target. You just don't have the backing of the Holy Spirit. You draw near to him, he draws near to you. And Simon, uh, Simon's name meant this. Simon's name meant withered reed. It's in your outlines there. And Jesus changed his name. He says, no longer will you be called, called Simon, you will be called Peter. And Peter meant rock. That's what his name meant. And he said, I'm going to change your name to rock. And upon that rock, the church... The gates of hell shall not prevail against that. I want you to know today that maybe Jesus is going to speak, speak to you and say, I want to change your name. Or maybe you've associated your name with loss or frustration or stress or sickness or worry or whatever it is you want to put in there. He says, I want to come and change your name so that there can be a firm foundation and you understand that as you lean into God, that God will lean into you and you'll see some things change in your life. God may want to change your name. How many of you would love to know that your name, like Simon, was like Withered Reed? How many, I mean, would that just encourage your heart? You know, your name is Simon, Withered Reed, you know, a blade of grass. You know, it's like, that's weak. You know, they, they went through in high school and uh, went around the class telling us what our last names meant. And uh, they got to Machen. Now, I, I do have to say that they got my name wrong, but it didn't matter. Because when you say something in high school and it's funny, you're done, Right? So they get around there like, Machen, Machen, German name means little girl. And I said, oh, thank you very much. Just say it in front of the whole class. So for the rest of the, at least the semester, everyone see me in the hallway, they'd be like, hey, little girl. I'd be like, shut up. You know, that make me so mad. And it wasn't until just two or three years ago, I was at the chiropractor and they had a student there that was, was a resident and she was from Germany. And for some reason that came up and she's like, oh yeah, I know what your name means. And I said, I know, I know, go ahead. Get it over with, little girl. And she says, no, your name doesn't mean little girl. She said, who told you that? And I said, a teacher in high school, of course, in front of everybody. And she said, no. She said, he got one little thing wrong, the way they pronounce it. She said, your name means machine or like machinist, which I'm like, I'll take that. That's, that's better than little girl. Yeah. Now, having said that, I told you how much I build with my hands and fix things. Not. But you may experience in the spiritual realm, this desire to, to have a deeper walk with God. You know what I mean? Not religious, want to float on clouds and do weird things. I'm talking about a real relationship where you know that you are loved by God and God is continually causing you to grow. You're becoming stronger. You're leading your family. You're, you're, you're letting your light shine in a way that it's never shown before. That happens when you allow Him to change your name. And you understand that you've got some choices to make, but the, the, the most basic one is if you lean into Christ, he leans into you. Now, I used to struggle with that and say, well, why do I have to go first? I think it should be God that goes first. Well, can I just tell you? He did. <laughs> when he went to the tree, cross tree of Calvary, he paved the way so that he could tell us, if you will draw near to me, I will draw near to you. If you're here today and you're struggling, frustrated, know this, leaning into Christ his, the power of his spirit's going to lean into you and give you his favor. So maybe, just maybe, today, some of us need to have a name change. You're no longer the, 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 the grumbler or the worrier or the anxious one. Maybe he wants to come and change your name and say, you're going to be steady. You're going to be solid. You're going to be a rock. And it's upon that rock that God will build his church. Because remember, folks, the church is not the building, right? It's the what? It's the people. I used to do this as a kid all the time. Here's the door and here's the steeple. Remember that? And they'd always freak me out. Open it up. And there's no people. And I'd go, no, that's not the way it goes. You know, and here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open it up. See all the people. The church is you and me. 
Therefore, it's vital that we lean in to God so that he leans into us. It was written in Luke chapter uh, 22 that, and I'm going to read the scripture in just a moment, the story of Simon Peter, but it starts off by saying this. It says that they arrested Jesus. And when they arrested Jesus, his disciples were with him, you know? And these disciples, they, they were saying, we're going to walk with you wherever you go. We're going to follow you. We got your back. And it says that as soon as Jesus was arrested and taken to the high priest's home, it says that Peter followed at a distance, at a distance, which tells me you can have the greatest intentions and even be somebody who's walking physically with Jesus and still have the same struggles that you and I have that cause us at times to, to, to distance, just gets in there. It starts to separate us. And so I want to talk to you about that, but let me, let me read this to you. This is, I already read the first verse to you. It says that Peter walked at a distance, but it says that when they had kindled the fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, you're one of them. You, 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 you identify with Jesus. But he denied them, saying, woman, I don't know who he is. And after a little while, another saw him and said, yeah, you are one of them. You're one of the followers. But Peter said, no, I'm, I'm not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, surely this fellow was with him, with Jesus. For he's a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. And it says that Peter went out and wept bitterly. You see, Peter at one point said, no, I'm doing good. This is where it's at. But when the pressures of life came on, he allowed there to be some distance. Again, my question is, where will we stand as we walk with God? And there's three areas we see in this story that I want to give you this morning when we look at the challenges about our closeness with God. And number one is this. You can write it down in your outlines. Uh, you could be possibly following at a distance, number one. Are you following at a distance? You see, Peter probably sensed danger. You know what it's like. You can be walking with somebody, and as soon as danger pops up, you, you tend to want to get, a, get away from that kind of danger. He followed at a distance instead of following and standing closely with Jesus. Are you? Am I? being a follower of God, but following at a distance. You see, if you're following somebody, somebody on Facebook, following somebody on Twitter, that's a whole different thing. And quite honestly, I think some of us are better at following Facebook and Twitter than we are sometimes at following after what God has for us. Uh, or would you take a step further and have a relationship with him that you want to cultivate in the deeper level? Uh, let me just say this. When God says he wants a deeper relationship with you, when God says he wants you to draw close to him so he can draw close to you, he doesn't want to change you to become somebody you're not. How many of you know that God loves you just the way you are? He loves you for who you are. He says, I just want to be a part of that. And he says, but I need you to make the decision. Are you going to follow me? Peter had made that choice. He said, yeah, I got your back. I'm with you. But then we, all of a sudden we see him following at a distance. And then the, there's a struggle that's there. Because he started to drift just a little bit. You see, there's two ways for us to decrease our distancing with God. And the first is this. It's a little bullet there. And write down, you and I must count the cost. We've got to count the cost at following at a distance. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, it says this. In fact, and this is not going to be the most encouraging verse that you're going to hear today, okay? But it's the truth, and it says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, will be persecuted. You might say, well, that doesn't make me feel good. No, it doesn't make me feel good either. But the truth is, is there's always going to be that bullseye that's on our chest. But when you live a godly life, you get the attention of, of the enemy, and he wants to take that out. You see, the word persecuted in Greek means this. It means to be pursued systematically. Uh, as if set in forth in rapid motion. Have you ever seen persecutions come at you, and when they do, it's like that? 
People want, want to stab you in the back or they, they got something gossipy to say or there's a, a negative report that they want to give. How, how is it that it's always the negative news that travels quicker than the positive news? How is that? Why is that? Well, it's because we live in a sin world. And it's because when that happens, we start hearing all of those things. When you make a decision to draw near to him, you've got to count the cost. There will be a, a price that will be exacted and, and when those negative words, they just come like that. I mean, they just happen. They just, uh, when it says the persecution, persecutions come, they come in rapid motion. When Lisa and I, rapid motion, I, I thought of uh, when we were in Bible college in 1995-96, we lived in the married housing. And, and I'm sad to say, but they had roaches there real bad. And nobody likes roaches. Big amen on that one, right? And nobody wants that. But have you ever gone into a house that had roaches there? And it's like all of a sudden when you flick the light on, it's like you saw just the carpet move or the, the, the countertop move for a split second. And it's because when you flip that light on, these roaches, they scattered, right? Do you know persecutions come at us that quick? Therefore, we need to draw near to God. We need to know that God has our back so that when we go through those situations, we know that God is on our side. Now, if we don't get that, if we don't embrace that, then we're left to our own devices and left alone, it's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a challenge. He says, I bring my grace and I give my mercy to you so that you and I can walk in the grace of God and grow in our spiritual journey, if I can say it that way, with God. Because when I say spiritual growth, it is about growing. When you think of as you get older and bigger, as I said, changing your clothing, uh, if you work out at a gym, uh, physical features start to change. Um, as you get older, things start to change. We understand change happens. But what we don't understand as easily is how to cooperate with the change that God wants to bring into our life. Because sometimes it challenges us and we feel threatened. Uh, we've got to remember, uh, l- let me read this to you from the book of John chapter 15. It says this, remember the word I spoke to you. He said, no servant is greater than his master. And if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you also. And if they obeyed my teachings, they would obey yours as well. Anything that you're about to go through as a result of growth, any difficult time, is not something that shocks God or takes him by surprise. He says, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. But if you draw near to me, my power can draw near to you so you can become better on the inside, so that you can grow and so that you can become stronger. See, we're going to go through times of persecutions. You've gone through them already. You could probably think back in your past and identify areas where you've gone through some pretty gnarly stuff, some, some difficult times. God just says this, I want to be there for you. I want you to draw near to me so I can draw near to you. But in order to do that, he says, count the cost. And then that next bullet, write down and intentionally press into Christ. If we're going to grow spiritually... He says, don't follow at a distance, but count the cost and then intentionally draw near to him, press into him. Psalm 73, verse 28. It's on the screen. It's in your outlines. It's real short. So read it with me. You ready? Go. The nearness of God is my good, is what he says. The nearness, the fact that God is near you is is a good thing. And we need to make God our refuge intentionally. Intentionally just means on purpose. Make sure you do it. Do it on purpose. Now, I, can't, I couldn't think of a better illustration than when I visited Lisa in Ecuador. She was there for a uh, missions trip in Quito, Ecuador. I've never been to Ecuador. It's Southern America. And uh, I quickly, quickly remembered they speak Spanish there and I don't, right? So I knew how to say taco, burrito, and I knew how to ask for a bathroom. Those are important things. I could survive right there, but I couldn't do anything else. And uh, they had a couple days, her and her partner, where they had to do some work, so uh, her uh, partner's husband and I got the opportunity to go to Quito, Ecuador and see all the beautiful things that were there. But remember, we don't speak their language. So they sent with us an interpreter, somebody who would be a, a mediator. So he could show us all the beautiful places and tell us not to go in the not so beautiful places. And we got to this, what I'll call, I don't know what they call it, but like a busing system. Uh, I don't want to say subway, but it was kind of like a bus slash train slash trolley thing, you know. It's the, their mode of transportation around there. And before the thing got to where we were at, there was so many people already. And he said this, he says, when the doors open, he said, do whatever it takes to get inside. 
And I said, you're kind of worrying me right now. <laughs> what do you mean, do whatever it takes? He says, there's a lot of people. And he says, so you got to press in as hard and as fast as you can so you don't miss the train. And I'm like, well, what happens if I miss it? He said, well, you got to wait for the next one. Well, what happens if I'm in the middle of the doorway and it closes? He says, it closes. He says, there's no safety, nothing there. He says, it's going to close and it's going to go. And so here comes that, that little train. And now I'm a little anxious, right? I'm a little concerned. I'm like stretching and getting ready to you know, run into this thing, and, and the, the train shows up, the doors open. The problem is, is there's so many people coming out that it was hard to get into that train. But we whittled through, and I never understood what it meant to pack in tightly or press in intentionally until I was on that trolley or that train, because we we're all jammed up like this. And no matter where I stood, I had somebody that, I mean, I could tell what five people had for lunch. It was that close. I mean, they're just right there, and you're all smashed up in this thing. And it gave me the greatest picture of when God says, intentionally press into Christ. Don't just sit around and flippantly wait for the rental car. He says, press in. Don't miss the blessings that God has for you. That only happens, that kind of closeness, when you on purpose, intentionally press in to what Christ has for us. Uh, count the cost. You've got to do that. But he says, but then also, make sure you intentionally press in so that you don't become, number two, write this down, someone who is blending into their surroundings. One of the fears or worries or maybe concerns is the word is, is when we don't draw near to God, we'll follow at a distance. Or number two, we will blend in to our surroundings. That's what Peter did. Remember, now remember Peter, the rock upon this church I, uh, or upon this this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And Peter said, no worry, I'm going to follow you. And he says, Peter, you don't understand. You're going to deny me. No, I won't. I won't. You know, I'm going to, I got your back, Jack. I'm going to follow you. And then all of a sudden, when the pressures of the world came on, he started to follow at a distance. And as he got even a little closer to it, he then blended into his surroundings. It says in Luke chapter 22, verse 56, that they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together. The people did this. And it says, Peter was sitting among them. In other words, he wanted to get close enough so that he could see what was going on with Jesus. He wanted to get close enough so he could hear the conversation. He wanted to get close enough so he could make a decision on what direction he needed to go. But he didn't want to get so close as to be associated. He blended in to his surroundings. In our lives, I ask the question, are we sitting among our community and blending in? Or are we standing for who we are, a son and daughter of the Most High God, a light in a dark place? Now, having said that, we need to stand. We need to let our light shine. Amen? Okay. We need to take a stand and let people know, yes, we're children of God, but I'm not saying that we have to be weird about it. I'm not encouraging you to walk down to McDonald's, stand on their table, and say, everybody can have your attention, please. Just thought I'd let you all know that I am a Christian. You do that. There's going to be a couple guys that will come they will escort you into a special car that has lots of colors on the top, and they will take you away. When you draw near to God, he doesn't say, become something you're not. He doesn't say, become religious. He doesn't say, become weird. He says, intentionally press in. Don't become somebody who follows at a distance nor blends into their surroundings because that's the challenge. It's so easy to blend in sometimes and just say, let's just get by. Let's just go along with status quo. Let's just do what everybody else is doing, not realizing that God has called or created so much more for us in our lives. So he says, don't follow at a distance. And, and don't be a people that blend into their surroundings. But there's a third thing we have to watch out for. And the third thing is this. Be careful not to be a people that are bowing to the pressures. Do not bow to the pressures in life. Because if you bow to the pressures, then it's no longer about an issue of distance. It's about, an issue. it's about a heart issue now because you're deciding to just say, I give up, I quit, I throw in the towel. The scripture says that Peter, and I'll jump over to Mark so I can read how, how it was worded there, but it says that Peter, when somebody said, hey, you're one of them, aren't you? And he said, no, that's not me. And the second person said, no, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's you. And he said, no, it's not. And he's getting a little more irritated. And by the time the third person said, surely you are one of them. It says in Mark chapter 14, verse 71, that he began to curse and swear. I don't know this man you're talking about. What happened? What happened was this. When the pressures came on, Peter chose to identify with who he was 
instead of who he is or what God wants him to be. And the same pressure that Peter felt then, we feel now. We can, we can feel that. We can feel the pressures of this world, even of just last year telling us what to do and how to do it. How does that affect who I am? How is it affecting my family and my relationships? Well, the greatest thing we need to do is not just ask all of those questions, but to draw near to him so that his Holy Spirit can draw near to you. Peter chose to identify at one point with who he was instead of who he is. And quite honestly, if we, if we, if we can just put it out there, sometimes... We've behaved in our, maybe our past, same way Peter did. We said, God, I'm never going to leave you. I've not got your back. I'm there. But then when the pressures came on, we started to question. We started to doubt. We started to worry. But God has never changed. And he's calling us to draw near to him so that we can see the realness and the wholeness of God and not become so frustrated with what we just see, which is all, all, all we can see is that what the world has to offer. But he says, when I give you my eyes, you get to see it the way that God sees it. And that changes everything. Sometimes it's too easy to behave like Peter at times. And we think things are going good. We'll proudly identify ourselves with God, proclaim that we're a Christian, but when the pressure comes on, what's going to come out? Is it going to be the fruit of the Spirit that's inside of you or not? You know, the Apostle Paul said in Romans, I love chapter, uh, Romans chapter 12. It's one of my, I, I don't know if you have top verses that you like, but, you know, I'm a pastor and I'm kind of a nerd, so I have my top 10 favorite, you know. This is in the top 10. It might even make the top five, but it's Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And it says this, Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Your mind, so that you may prove uh, the will of God, that which is uh, good, perfect, and acceptable. He says, <clears throat> Do not be conformed, but be transformed. You see, we cannot... Let the external factors affect who we are. The word conform means to allow the pressures of the world to shape us externally so that we start to become like what the world wants us to become like. But being transformed means that there's changes that are happening on the inside of us. And when these changes, this spiritual growth takes place, then it not only affects the inside, but it, is, it starts to affect the outside. It starts to affect our finances, our giving, our marriage, our, 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 our ability to, to, to share Jesus, whatever that means. But it starts first and foremost on the inside when we draw near to him. The question remains, where will you stand? You know, you got to identify where you're at. Next week, we're going to start talking about why should I want spiritual growth? What are the benefits? Or, you know, why, why should I want to do it? And then we'll talk about what that means. But we've got to understand that God loves us with an everlasting love. God is so good to us, and he's so kind to us, that if we ever drift away, you know what he does? He calls us back. He calls us back. There's times, I grew up in a Christian home, my mom and dad obviously being senior pastors. I knew church. I, I, I knew Christianese. I knew how to say the right things. I, know, I knew how to do all that, but I didn't at one point have a personal relationship with God. I started making poor choices, doing my own thing. And it wasn't until I came to a personal relationship. In other words, taking all I am and all the, 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 the junk of the decisions I made and I brought it to Jesus that he said, well done. He, he, he didn't worry about all the mistakes I made. He didn't worry about all the things I screwed up. What he wanted more than anything was closeness with me. And when I figured that out, all of a sudden it transformed me and then all the things I've been trying to fix on the outside they took care of themselves because I allowed him to be inside. You see, I, I, we, we, a couple months ago, we talked about marriage and um, this transforming work that God wants to do. And, and I can say this because we talked about it and uh, I kind of put her on, on notice first service when I said it. So, but I love this that we have. But I remember a time when I loved her, but I, I, I couldn't figure it all out. And I remember we were going through some struggles because we shared with you that we had those just like anyone else. But I remember going to God and saying, God, I'm going to draw near to you so that I can tell you what you need to do to fix her. That was my mindset. Now, I didn't say those words, but I might as well have because that's what I was thinking. So, Father, I am being obedient to your word. I am drawing near to you. And now that I'm near to you, here's what I need you to do. 
that's not the approach you take to God. He, he wanted me to approach him for me, and I didn't get that. And so there, not only was there still struggles, but there was probably even more. It was like adding gasoline to a fire, maybe. You know, think of that analogy. And so it wasn't until when I figured out personally that when I draw near to God, it's so that God can receive me for who I am. And I came to him and I said, God, I ask you to just change my heart, oh God. Renew me, transform me. And when I received that, all of a sudden, things started to change on the inside. And now as I draw near to God, I draw near to God because of, of what I want from him and that closeness and that relationship. And when I did that, then this started to become healthier. Why? Because she was doing the same thing. She was seeking God for her. I was seeking God for me. And as a result of that closeness, this starts to work better. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, I need to see a financial health or a breakthrough. You know, that's going to come as you draw near to him and find out what God has to say. I need direction for my life. What school am I going to go to? What profession am I going to choose? You get closer to God, God starts to reveal to you the many gifts he's put within you. And if you've ever made a mistake and if you've ever screwed up, which should be all of us, know that you can never push God so far away or bring such disappointment that God would not receive you back. Or want you. It, Peter, look at what, what happened to Peter. It says, the Lord turned in verse 61. It says, the Lord turned and gave, uh, looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the words of the Lord. Let me just say this. Growing up, when you did something wrong, did you ever get the look from your parents? You know what I'm talking about? You do something crazy. Uh, for me, it probably happened at church quite often, and I could be at one end, and all I'd have to do is look across, and I could see my mom looking at me, and she would not have to say one word. I, I could read her mind. I knew something's wrong. I knew I was in trouble, and I probably knew why. I just didn't think she'd see me, and when she did, she gave me the look, and as soon as I did that, man, it, you stopped doing everything. Well, here Peter says, I'm not going to deny you. I'm not going to leave you. And then all of a sudden he does three times. The rooster crows. And when the rooster crows, he goes, and he looks over and says, Jesus looked at him. I can only imagine what that moment must have felt like for Peter. Uh, the disappointment that he had. The fear maybe that was going through his heart. But here's the reality. When, when you end that story, it says that Peter left. And that when he left, he was weeping because of the brokenness, realizing the poor choices he made. But do you know what? In the midst of all of that, God's grace was still there. Now, if you and I were Jesus in that scenario, we'd probably want to punish him, right? Uh, we'd hold a grudge. We'd never forget. But Jesus says that he not only forgives, but he forgets. It says that he brings grace and mercy into those areas where we've had maybe some guilt and shame. You know, this is a prayer that I've prayed often. Uh, and it's one that we have to remind ourselves. But the enemy is always going to try to uh, allow guilt and shame in your life to always be a boat anchor that holds you back from ever getting to the promises of God. And so many times I have to come to God when I mess up and when I make a mistake, because I still do. And I say, Jesus, Lord, I, will you take my sin? Will you take my guilt? Will you take my shame? And Lord, I'm asking you to replace it with your grace, with your mercy, and with your forgiveness. And as you know, he's always been faithful to forgive. He's always been faithful. There is nothing that you can do that ever pushes God away so far or so bad that he would not want to have a close relationship with you. And as we start off this year, I felt it just being a great reminder that though it's been a tough, tough year, um, I'd love to tell you right now, hey, things can only go up. Things can only get better. I'd love to tell you that, but, but I can't. But what I can tell you is God's grace is always sufficient, no matter what you're going through, and that when you do choose to draw near to God, he not only will draw nearer to you, but he will give you his mind. He will give you his eyes. He'll let you see things in a whole different realm. The things we worry about, sometimes they're just inconsequential. I've worried about things that years later I look back and said, why did I waste my time worrying about that? But I did. God had been telling me to let go of it. Don't worry about it. Forget about it. I've got this and I would still worry. I believe 
that this is a time, this is a good time, not because it's just the first of the year, but it's a good time for us as a church to remind ourselves who we are in Christ Jesus. Some of us need a name change here today. And it's not worry, not shame, not guilt, not sin, not fear, no anxiety, but that our name becomes more associated with grace and mercy, with forgiveness, solidarity, and remind ourselves that we too are a rock. We are the church. And upon this rock, God will build his church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against that. Maybe today you're here and you're saying, these have been some real issues, Pastor, struggles that I've faced. We've got to listen to those in authority over us. We've got to honor them, but we've got to remind ourselves too who we are. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. You and I, we know what an ambassador is. An ambassador is sent to a foreign country. They're placed on that soil so that they can have the inner workings and relationships and they represent the United States of America. They belong to the United States, even though they live in a foreign land. And God says, you and I, we're ambassadors for Christ. In other words, folks, we are the children of God. We do not belong to this world. But while we live here, he says, let your light shine in such a way. Some of us, we've chosen to shut off the flashlight. We've, we've chosen to flip off the switch. It's been so difficult, frustrating, and, and anxious that we just said, we'll just wait till the conditions get better. Folks, the conditions will not get better. The conditions will only change when we let the light shine and we start learning about the goodness of God and drawing close to him. My challenge to you is simply this. As we go over the next few weeks, are you, are you ready to grow? You know, you're going to choose at what rate and speed you want to grow, but I'm here to tell you, that whatever it is you choose, when you draw near to him, he will reveal himself to you. He will give you an anointing that authorizes you, empowers you to do the things that you never thought you could. And he will give you the grace and the mercy to weather every storm that you may potentially go through. How do you know that? His word says it. What's our job? Draw near to him and watch what God will do. Amen, church? Father, I thank you that you do love us so much. Lord, for those that are here today, for those that are watching online, I'm praying that your Holy Spirit will meet us right where we are. For some, we're here today and we've been going through difficulties, relational challenges. We've been going through just even self-assessment and we're feeling like we just don't quite add up. We're not good enough. But your word says that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. There's some that may be watching online right now and you're sitting in your very own home and you're struggling with the challenges. You're maybe afraid to go out or, or, or maybe it's just a, this all-consuming worry or fear that comes upon your life. God says, I can meet you right where you're at in your very own home. You'll draw near to me. He says, I'll draw near to you. So Father, we receive that in the name of Jesus, asking that you will come and that you will consume us, Father, with a grace that goes beyond what our human bodies uh, are capable of receiving, what our minds are capable of, of producing. Lord, we're asking for the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives. And we receive that and we walk out today, understanding that we walk out in that anointing, that, that authority that you give to us. We receive because of the blood of Jesus. And we walk in that kind of an anointing, knowing that no matter where we go, Lord God, you walk before us and you will pave the way. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to ask if you'll go ahead and stand with me as we get ready to dismiss. I believe God wants to do some new, uh, some great things in your life. And he's just asking, asking us to cooperate with him. As we get ready to go today, uh, just have your hearts open. Look for what God is going to do. As we